Amen. Well, a while ago, we started a journey through the gospel of Luke. Gospel simply means good news. And uh, Luke is actually a doctor. He's a medical doctor, but he's also a biographer. He's a writer. He's literary. He wrote the gospel of Luke. And uh, the, he tells us in the first part of Luke, uh, Luke chapter 1. Um, here's what we read in Luke chapter 1. If you have your Bible, you can open that up uh, to Luke chapter 1. And uh, you can read along with me the first four verses. Now, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, some of the verses we'll have up on the screen behind us, but there's others that I'll just be mentioning as we go along. So if you have a Bible, you do want to follow along. If you uh, have your phone with you, then you have a Bible. Maybe you didn't know that. But if you have your phone, you have a Bible. There's an app called YouVersion, Y-O-U Version, and it's free. And you can download it on the App Store. We have Wi-Fi here, so you can do that right now. Um, if, you, if you need to. Luke chapter 1, Luke writes, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. Now, what events is he talking about? Well, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus, who uh, was born, we believe, of a virgin. Her name was Mary. That he, excuse me, that he walked the earth. He came from heaven. He was God's own son. He walked the earth. And um, while he was here, he lived a perfect life. He ended up dying on a cross, being accused and ultimately tried and convicted in a, in, a, in a kangaroo court, in a mockery of a trial, if you will. He was killed, but the word was that he was raised again three days later, and that he was alive. And Luke comes along a mere 20 to 30 years after this all happened, and he writes what we now call the Gospel of Luke. So those are the events that have been fulfilled. The Messiah had been predicted in all the Old Testament scriptures and had been fulfilled in Jesus. That's what he means. Verse 2, they used the eyewitness reports uh, circulating among us from the early disciples. Now circle that word eyewitness because that's absolutely vital because his material, what he wrote, came from people who saw. People who were there with Jesus, they saw it with their own eyes. They didn't get it secondhand. They saw it firsthand, and they passed it on to Luke and the other gospel writers. Verse 3, having carefully investigated everything, that's what Luke's saying. Now, he's a doctor. He's highly meticulous, very intelligent guy. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, all right, it goes all the way back, as uh, we see in this chapter, to the prophecies that were fulfilled uh, with Zechariah and Elizabeth and the birth of John, who became John the Baptist, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you. And who is you? Most honorable Theophilus. Now, we don't know anything more about Theophilus than what he writes, than what he says here. What we do know about Theophilus is this. When a letter or a writing, uh, a journal, this sort of thing, was dedicated to you, when your name was put on it, in the first century, that was the typical way you honored the person who paid for the work that was being done. The person who financed the project typically was honored in the opening of the writing. Okay? And so... That's what's going on here, we believe. Uh, and that is that Theophilus was actually the financier, if you will, right? I mean, he was the angel investor, so to say, that provided the finances Luke would need, because Luke would need a lot. He did this over the course of a long time. I mean, he had lodging, he had food, he had interviews, he may have had assistants that worked with him. It was a pretty significant project in order to do it correctly. And today, what's really amazing, what I love about this is we have the Gospel of Luke, and we also have the book of Acts, which, by the way, whenever we finish up the Gospel of Luke here, we're going to go right into the, to the book of Acts. So we kind of get this whole story of the life of Jesus and then the early church, one right after another. And, but what's so cool here, what I like so much, is that Theophilus gave his money and Luke gave his intellect. And together, we have Luke-Acts. 
Isn't that cool? I, I just think that that's great. And it shows us that each one of us need to give what we can. And some of us, you know, we have the ability to give financially. And so we need to give as much financially as we can. Others, you've got intellect. You've got intellect that can be used for all kinds of resources within the church. Others of you, you got big hearts. You're really good with people. We, we need you to unleash that big heart here at Woodlands, you know, to show love and encourage. Some of you, some of you are really good at following Jesus. You've been doing it a long time. There's things you do that have helped you become a strong disciple of Christ. We need you to reach back, if you will, and grab the hand of someone younger than you who doesn't know Christ as well, who's early in their journey, and help bring them along. So as I prepare to continue... Uh, this journey. Next week, I hope, will be in chapter 10. I thought it would be best to revisit what we've covered so far. Uh, today's our second week of review. We started the review last week, and I didn't get through it all. So uh, you can pray that I'll get through it all this week, all right? Um, and you can also catch up with last week's message or any of our previous messages on our YouTube channel at woodlands.cc. So you can go there to, actually it's Woodlands Community Church on um, YouTube. Our website is woodlands.cc. So you can just search Woodlands CC and you'll find, you'll find it there. Now in this passage uh, of Luke chapter 1, he also says that, um, that, that these eyewitnesses and these servants, they handed it down. Now this phrase, handed down, is, it's, it's the best we can do in English, but it doesn't capture the word used in Greek. The Greek is the language that the New Testament was originally written in, and it's the word paradosis. And this word paradosis, I, I touched on this last week, it means this, memorizing exactly what a teacher said and did, then passing it on without changing it at all. That's what, it, that's what paradosis is. And that's what he's referring to when he says they handed down what they learned from the eyewitnesses. They handed down what they were taught. They handed down what they saw. And as we talked about briefly last week, we don't memorize hardly anything today, right? Our brains have gotten soft in the area of memorization because we have everything at our fingertips, right? We don't even memorize phone numbers anymore. Okay, uh, and, and so the fact is, but that was not the case in the first century. The, writing paper was not readily available. Pens were not readily available. If you didn't memorize it, you didn't get it. And when that's the life you live, when that's how you train your brain, it is incredible what our brain can remember and what it can, what, what it can hold on to when we train it and work it uh, that way. Well, as we mentioned last week, we looked at the birth of John the Baptist. It was prophesied about, and then he was born. We looked at the birth of Jesus. It was prophesied about, and then he was born. And then the next time we saw Jesus was when he was 12 years old. We talked briefly on that. And uh, verse uh, 249, Luke 249 uh, where his parents caught up to him in the temple after missing him for three days, he said to them, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? And that was really unique. He said that because Jews never said my father. They always said our father. So to say my was a statement of his identity. Jesus was stating at 12 years old, God is not just my God. God is literally my father. So that statement, and um, that's pretty incredible. And this is the theme that we're going to see throughout these first nine chapters of Luke. What is the identity of this God-man? Who is this that works all these miracles and that makes all these crazy statements because when you think about Jesus, folks, here's the thing. He claimed to be the Son of God. If he's not the Son of God, he's not a good person. He's a liar and a charlatan. 
and nobody should pay attention to anything he says. But if he is the Son of God, then we'd better listen and listen close. Because everything that he's saying in Scripture about him and that he says is true. And that means he's coming back. Because that's what he tells us. That he came the first time like a lamb. To be sacrificed on the cross. To save you and me from our sins. Those of you watching online. To save you from your sins. But he's coming back. And when he comes back, he's coming back as a lion. And he's coming back to bring judgment. And the ones who will be gathered into his arms are those who have received his free gift of salvation. Those who have accepted him as the Son of God. Who is he? Who is this guy? Well, approximately 18 years go by. And uh, he shows up again. Nothing's written about him from the age of 12 to the age of 30. Jesus shows up um, down by the Jordan River, right? He's down there. Now, his cousin, remember John, his cousin? Well, he's now um, John the Baptizer. He's now got this great ministry. He is now recognized as a prophet. I mean, John had people coming to him by the droves. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to say for sure. We don't know this for a fact. But many of the theologians and scholars who study this thing believe that John probably baptized literally thousands of people during his ministry there along the Jordan River, calling for repentance. His baptism was one of repentance. He was calling the people of, 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 of Israel... He was calling them to repent of their sin and to be made clean. Folks, how many of us here today need to repent of our sin? How many of us need to recognize that we need to say, God, I'm sorry. I'm blowing it. And there's somebody that's been hurt by our sin. And we need to go to them. We need to look them in the eye. We need to say, I'm so sorry. Would you please forgive me? That's how you make relationships right, by the way. When you go to people and you say you're sorry, that's how we heal relationships. And that's why we have to do it. That's why, as uncomfortable as it is, we need to have that conversation. Well, John is fulfilling the calling that he had to prepare the way for Jesus. As a matter of fact, in Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, written 400 years before John was born, we read this, Malachi 3.1, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Jesus comes then to John down by the Jordan River, right? And I always, I always think he, he, he comes down and he tells John he wants to get baptized. And we talked about this a lot in the full message I gave on this. You can go back in the archives, so to say, in, uh, uh, on YouTube or on our website. And you can listen to the whole messages, these whole messages there. I'm just giving you bits and pieces of them to kind of get us caught up, uh, uh, back on track, so to say. But John and Jesus had this interaction because John knows that Jesus is the Messiah. He knows he's the one. And Jesus comes to John and says, would you baptize me? And John says, no, you ought to baptize me. And they go back and forth. And finally, Jesus wins. He always does. And, and so he gets baptized by John. There, through. But something absolutely amazing happens when Jesus goes down into the water by John. And he comes back up. Evidently, the heavens opened up. Something that looked like a dove descended down on Jesus. And words thundered from above, you are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. 
And the glory of that is that every single one of you who have surrendered your life to Jesus, God says the same thing about you. God looks down at you and says, you are my son. You are my daughter whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And some of you are sitting there saying, well, that sounds nice, man, but you don't know me. You don't know, you don't know what I've done. Yeah, you know what? God knows everything you've done. And because you love Jesus, he's forgiven you. And so he is well pleased with you right now. And he always will be. No matter what you've done, no matter what you will do, he has and will forgive you. Because you're his son. You're his daughter. He loves you. He loves you. Once again, though, what is this about? It's all about Jesus' identity. So here he is, 30 years old. He gets baptized down by the river. A voice literally comes from heaven identifying him as God's own son. His time for public ministry has come, but first there's a test. And again, we see the question, who is this? Luke tells us that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit now, he's been baptized, he's full of the Holy Spirit, And Luke tells us that he went into the wilderness. And into the wilderness, he fasted for 40 days. And he prayed. And what happened there? He was tempted by Satan. For 40 days, he goes into this temptation, right? And what's happening here? What does this sound like to you? God's own son going into the wilderness where he is there praying with God, and Satan comes to tempt him. It's exactly like the Garden of Eden. What's happening here, folks, is a Garden of Eden do-over. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, they were tempted by Satan. They failed, and they gave in to the sin, and they joined forces with Satan, so to say. When Jesus went into the wilderness, he too was tempted by Satan, but he did not give in. He did not fall to temptation. He did not sin. Essentially, what's happening here, Jesus, the second Adam, he was in the wilderness, tempted by Satan, but Jesus has come to set things right. So the essence of what Luke is telling us is that Satan in the wilderness was making a play for Jesus. Just as in spy life, espionage, we always see this on spy movies, right? Where somebody's trying to turn someone from one side to the other. This is exactly what we see happening in the temptation account. Satan is tempting Jesus with all of these things, all of these rewards, all of these prizes, trying to make his life comfortable, trying to give him power, trying to give him sex, trying to give him money. And he's saying, and it was Satan's right evidently to provide this, that Jesus, you come and join me and we'll rule together. Satan literally went after God's son. And Jesus rebuked him and rebuffed him with three scriptures. And that's how we fight the devil. We rebuff him with the word of God. We call it out and push him back by quoting the word of God, scripture to him. Putting him in his place. The last thing he said, the old devil, was you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Oh, I thought I was talking to Jesus. You were. He's God. Once again, we see Luke addressing the question, who is this man? Jesus. He makes it clear to Satan, the Father and I are one. You don't come between us. You never will. You came between Adam and Eve and the Father, but you'll never come between me and the Father. And folks, that is the key to every relationship that we have. Don't let anything come between you and your relationship with the Heavenly Father.
And if nothing comes between you and your relationship with the Heavenly Father, then He will guard and protect you in your earthly relationships as well. One with God, one with one another. That's what Jesus prayed for in John 17 in the garden before His death. Jesus passes the test because it was a test. The word temptation can also be translated test. Jesus had this test that he had to pass before he could continue his public ministry. And folks, I dare say that many of us here today have been tempted over and over and over again, and we have failed the test over and over and over again, and that has limited our ministry and our ability to be fruitful and effective in the kingdom of God. I know from my own personal life, there are things I feel I have been tested in, things that I have failed over and over again. And when I finally gain victory over those things, I, I always sense that God has more for me, more for me to do, more responsibility, more leadership in the kingdom. Luke tells us Jesus' next step was to visit the home, a home in Nazareth. That was his hometown. So Jesus has started his public ministry. He's down by the Jordan River. He heads back up north near, uh, near, to Nazareth where he lived, his hometown. And here he begins his public preaching ministry. He invites the scroll of Isaiah to be brought to him. And he reads uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 19. I think we have that up here, don't we? All right. Hey, would everybody just read this with me? Everybody read this with me. Ready? The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And when he read this in the synagogue at Nazareth, everybody liked it. They thought it was pretty cool. They were like, isn't this Joseph's boy? Hey, how about that? Hometown boy does good, right? Pretty excited about that. But then he gave them an illustration <clears throat> about the widow of Zarephath in Sidon, which was a Gentile territory, who was very poor, and General Naaman of Syria, who had leprosy, and, and he was healed in the Old Testament uh, by Elisha. And... Uh, when he gave them those examples of Gentiles, they didn't like him anymore. As a matter of fact, they hated him. And they tried to kill him right there in his hometown. But the Bible says that Jesus just kind of walked through them. Okay? The widow was very poor. The general was very rich. So you don't have to be literally poor in order to receive salvation. Nor does it mean that if you are poor you'll automatically receive salvation. But Jesus does say that he comes to bring salvation to the poor. So what does that mean? It means both examples are of those who are spiritually poor. And until each and every one of us recognize we are spiritually poor, we are not ready to receive Jesus' free gift of salvation. We have to recognize and acknowledge that we're spiritually poor. Um, they are spiritual outcasts. Naaman had leprosy. Uh, the widow of Zarephath was poor. A, a poor widowed woman would have made her an outcast. They're religious outcasts. They're not part of the Jewish community. They are moral outcasts. I mean, Naaman was a killer. He had killed many men, right? So they're, they're, they're moral outcasts. They don't do the right things. Everything about those two um, would have been bad in the eyes of the Jews. And yet Jesus points out that both of them received miracles while Jewish people did not during difficult times uh, written about in the Old Testament. So what is Jesus' point? His point is this. The only people I come to are people who understand that they are spiritual and moral outcasts. People who know they have nothing of value before God. That's who he comes to. And that's why he had such trouble with the Pharisees. Because they thought they were morally superior. And if you think you are morally superior to anyone, then Jesus is going to have a problem with you. Just letting that soak in for a minute. Next time you walk by a homeless person with their cup out, and you have that thought in your head, 
Get a job. That may be the answer. They probably could get a job. Yeah, they probably could work somewhere. Lots of people are hiring, right? But that doesn't make us superior to them. And that's the point. That's the point. In Luke 4.31, Jesus drives out a demon. When Jesus drives out a demon in Luke 4.31, um, one thing we notice, if you look at all the times that Jesus drove out demons, and you put them together, we come together with a list of the things that demons can actually do physically to people. Number one, demons can cause a mental disorder. Uh, look at John chapter 10, verse 20. And you can see that some mental issues are indeed caused by demons. I'm not saying they all are. But today we tend to overlook that and don't even give that a second thought. But the fact is the demonic can cause mental issues with people. Uh, the second thing is that demons can cause violent action. When you see people acting out violently, irrationally, you know, kind of coming out of nowhere and being extremely violent, you're looking at people um, who may be demonically possessed. I can't help but think that every one of these fools who's gone into a school and opened up their guns are demonically possessed in some degree or another. That's just my opinion, okay? You can take it for what it's worth. But if we don't look at the demonic's role in the most evil things that happen, then I think we're missing the point. Um, bodily disease. In Luke 13, we see that demons can actually cause you to get sick. Um, and then in Revelation 16, we see that demons can cause people to rebel against God. People who are rebelling against God may actually be battling demonic possession or oppression. Here's the thing. Every miracle that Jesus does in Scripture, every single one of them are a sign of the kingdom of God. Every miracle he does, he does to show you that in the kingdom of God, this bad thing that he's fighting will not exist. So when Jesus casts a demon out of somebody, what he's telling us is, because Jesus always represents the kingdom of God, Okay, the rule and reign of God, that's what the kingdom of God is, where God rules and God reigns. When Jesus casts out a demon, what he's saying is, there will be no more evil in the kingdom of heaven. There will be no more demonic influence once Jesus comes back and the judgment day happens and we're all brought together in heaven. Now that should make some of us really excited. That should make some of us really, really excited. In Luke chapter 4, verses 42 to 44, Jesus prays. And um, in that, we see that uh, he's just healed a lot of people. He's just done a lot of miracles. But now um, he, he spends some time in prayer. And when he spends time in prayer, it helps him to refocus his mission. He realizes he's here uh, to preach the kingdom of God. And here we see one of the many values of prayer. When you look at this, we see that in prayer, that a prayer allows us to reorder and recategorize our priorities. Because many of us get our priorities way out of whack, don't we? Many times we feel like, yeah, have you ever felt like you're just a chicken running around with your head cut off? Yeah, you ever felt that way? <clears throat> I sure have. You know, I get to the end of the day sometime. I try to plan my days. My goal is the night before, I want to make a plan for what I'm going to do the next day. Uh, but sometimes, you know, I, get, I, I have my plan. I get started. I get a phone call. Somebody stops in. Next thing you know, the whole day is just off track. And I get to time to come home, right? And I'm like, I can get a dang thing done today, you know? And it doesn't mean I actually didn't. There were some things that happened. But what that means is I didn't get anything done that I wanted to get done that was on my list of things to get done. Prayer. Prayer is one of the best ways to reorder our day. When you feel like everything's just going crazy, when you feel like you're running around like the proverbial chicken with his head cut off, so to say, when you feel like everything's just, just not, you know, like people all over you are demanding your attention. They, everybody needs something from you. 
That's exactly what was happening with Jesus. Everybody was coming to him, asking to be healed. His disciples had an agenda for him. You know, they, they kind of liked this healing ministry. It made him very popular, right? They wanted to keep doing this. We see in Mark chapter 3, uh, we get a little, a, a little more input. I think it's Mark chapter 2, actually. We get a little more insight into Peter's dialogue with Jesus there on this passage. So Jesus goes away. He gets up early in the morning ahead of everybody else while it's still dark. And he goes out to a solitary place where he won't be bothered. And he spends a long time in prayer. Not five minutes. Not 20 minutes. He spends hours sitting with God. Now, some of you all think that's just a huge waste of time, don't you? I can see it. Some of you are fidgety right now. Some of, you, some of y'all are looking at me like, this guy's whack. You know, I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, come on, 15 minutes with God? Okay, that's stretching it, but I might try that. An hour with God alone? Two hours with God alone? Three hours with God alone? Some of you may know the name Martin Luther. He was a reformer from the 15th century, and he's known as kind of the father of the Reformation. Martin Luther King Jr. was named after him. Martin Luther is quoted in his journal as saying, I have so much to do today that I'm going to need to get up three hours early just to pray about it. What in your schedule, what in your schedule, where have you set aside time to pray? Folks, I'm all about the eight hours sleep, right? And there's been a lot of studies coming out these days talking about how important eight hours of sleep is. Every time I read one of those studies, I say yes and amen. I want my eight hours of sleep. But I know this for a fact. I've gone through periods of time in my life where I've gone week after week after week on five hours of sleep. But during those times, I've gotten up, and the first thing I did was spend an hour with God in prayer. It's the first thing I did on five hours sleep. (laughs) God has a way of carrying us. He has a way of carrying us. When we turn to him for our power, this week, will you reprioritize your day? Will you reprioritize your life? This week, when you start your list of what you're going to got to get done, would you put at the very top of it, prayer? I don't know if I can do that. I've never just sat for very long. Just take your Bible. If you have a paper Bible, I recommend it. If you don't have a paper Bible and you want one, tell me. I'll give you one. We've got some extras around here. <laughs> Churches are good for that. Sit down with your Bible and just start reading. Go to Luke because we're studying Luke. Start reading and start praying as things come to mind in your life while you're reading. It's really that simple. That's a good thought to wrap up on. So let's close it out right there. I'm going to invite you all to stand together with me as we pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, we want to thank you for your great love for us. We thank you, God, for how you provide for us. Lord, I... I I know that my life is like many people here. You know... 
I'm, I'm probably this side of heaven, never going to live in a house that people drive by and go, wow, look at that place. And yet you provided such a nice home for me. Uh, Ruth and I are so thankful for it. Probably never drive a Corvette or a Mercedes or a, even a BMW. But God, I drive a nice car. Uh, and I've always been able to drive cars that run. Uh, I've never been stranded. I've always been able to get from point A to point B. God, I'm no spiritual hero. I don't have books that people read and recognize my name. Don't know that I ever would. And yet you use me every single day in some way or another, in somebody's life. To spread the good news of your kingdom. And so Lord, I just pray for every one of us here today. Lord, help each one of us to focus on your great provision. Help every one of us to focus on your purpose for us. Lord, help every one of us to begin our day in prayer where the things of earth resume their normal size. Oh, yes. Let us spend time with you in prayer where the things of earth resume their normal size. And in that, Lord, fill us with joy. Fill us with joy with what we have. Fill us with joy with who we know. Fill us with joy with who we love and who loves us. Lord, it's been said that joy is the defining mark of the Christian faith. God, fill us with your joy. And I know you can only do that if we pause long enough to spend time with you. We've got to be still. We've got to prioritize our life around your schedule. Jesus, we want you to be the center. The center of our hearts. The center of our minds. The center of our work. The center of our homes. The center of our families the center of our relationships. And dad, at the end of the day, we'd love to hear those words. This is my son. This is my daughter whom I love. With you, I'm well pleased. I know you want to tell us that every day. Lord, help us to be still and quiet enough to hear you encourage each one of us with those amazing words that come from your heart, demonstrated in your love through your son Jesus, who died on the cross to save us from our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with every good thing to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Much love to all of you. Have a great week. 
Look forward to seeing you next week where we'll uh, wrap up this uh, introduction and bring a friend with you. I'd like to meet your friends. God bless you.